Okay, so um, more, more verses? All right, so the practice of all the bodhisattvas is to take to solitary places, avoiding the unwholesome so that destructive emotions gradually fade away. And in the absence of distraction, virtuous practice naturally gains strength. Whilst with awareness clearly focused, we gain conviction in the teachings. So this is almost like saying the opposite thing of the previous verse. In the previous verse, it's saying, don't give all the power to external objects. In this version, it's saying, external objects can be very influential, avoid some. <laughs> so it's tricky, right? Because it's really helping you understand day to day, the power you've given things varies. And there are certain conditions that you've given so much habitual power to that it's better to step away from them while you gather strength. And you're not saying that that's the reason you do the thing, but it's so commonly a part of you doing the thing, whatever the thing is, that you need to separate from it while you build a different skill set. Which is why going into retreat is useful, why going into rehab for you know many multiple times over a great period of time can be useful, why therapy is useful. You're breaking out of the familiar pattern and giving it space so that you can build a new skill because it's very hard to build a new skill in amongst the same old condition. So it's like you're not giving credit to the condition for your bad behavior, but you're still acknowledging that was a very strong condition and so I need to separate from it. And so when this verse says be in solitary places, it doesn't necessarily mean you need to be a hermit or you need to go to a cave. It means you need to have an inner retreat space. Yeah, an inner retreat space that is less reactive or non-reactive a place, maybe it's physically as well, where you can collect your thoughts and come back to your core values and come back to your primary motivation of bodhicitta. So that might mean that there needs to be less activity in your life. Maybe it doesn't. But you know, if you know that you vent and gossip and get very negative with this one friend and every time you're with them you vent and you get negative and you just rile each other up and it's kind of half fun but half agitating and then when you come home you're all kind of jangly and you annoy the people in your household it might be worth looking at that dynamic and maybe not spend so much time with them and it doesn't mean you're giving up on them and it doesn't mean that it's their fault and it doesn't mean any of those things. It just means that you haven't yet developed a skill set strong enough to not be influenced by that. You know, and so you just really very personally, this is such a personal verse where what does it mean for you to live in a solitary place? You know, how much solitary do you need in order to make new neural pathways and new mental habits, et cetera, et cetera because avoiding unwholesome activities, destructive emotions gradually fade. And then when there's not distraction, virtuous practice naturally gains strength. And then when you're focused, you gain even more conviction in the teachings, which makes it easier to practice. So it's like self-reinforcing in this really positive way. Is that making sense? Yeah, so on the one hand, you know, we're not giving everything all the power. On the other hand, we're recognizing we have given things power historically and so gently disengaging by changing some, some habits. Yeah. Can, can you think of some examples? Like, you know, it's not the fault of the person or the object or the whatever, but if you're around it, you'll do it. You know, does anybody not drink soda pop, but if it's in the house, you totally will, <laughs> you know? You won't binge on Netflix, but if you have a subscription, you will, <laughs> you know? Whatever it is, it's like, if it's there, you'll do the thing and it's the very thing that you'll regret. So don't be around the thing, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So this is an internal thing where you're not, um, I guess you're not blaming. Yeah, you're not blaming, but you're still creating a separation and a boundary. I think that one's probably pretty clear. I was just curious if you guys had any fun examples or painful examples. So then the fourth is the practice of all the bodhisattvas is to renounce this life's concerns. 
her friends and relatives, long acquainted, must all go their separate ways. Wealth and prized possessions, painstakingly acquired, must all be left behind. And consciousness, the guest who lodges in the body, must in time depart. So this is the verse on impermanence. And impermanence is not good news or bad news, but remembering it can prevent both grief and attachment. When you know that things are going to change, you don't have that same shock and disappointment. And, you know, to renounce this life's concerns, it doesn't mean that you don't have any goals or ambitions. It's just that you're not thinking that that's the be all and end all. You know, so what's an example of that? To renounce life's concerns while still having some goals and plans. You know, like there might be something that you're thinking about that's really worthwhile and you do want to do it, but it's very much of this one life and it's very worldly. Is there a way you can still have that as a goal, but turn it into a spiritual path or have it conditioned or imbued with bodhicitta? You know, for example, you want to write the great American novel and you're writing, you're writing and writing and writing and it takes up a huge amount of your time. And then you think, oh, wow, this is just about this life. And this is about some sort of ego legacy. I want people to think about me and know who I was after I die. And it's this whole ego trip. But I still kind of want to do it because I've got ideas to share and I've got things that can help connect people and entertainment and I can help them take the edge off samsara for a minute. Is it so bad? I want to write my book. You know, say it's something like that. You could say to yourself, all right, the habit energy that I'm bringing to this activity is more important than the activity. And I can still do the activity. So if I'm doing the activity, I need to think, how is this in alignment with my spiritual path? Am I being rude and disengaging from my family in an abrupt and abrasive way? I have to write my book. You know, am I neglecting certain responsibilities because this is really important? You know, or am I kind of bringing everybody into the conversation and saying, oh, I'm stuck with this character and what do you think about this? And you're making a collaborative thing. You know, whatever, like it's just an example. But, but to really think about the thing that so many of the plans we have in this life, no one's going to remember or care after we die. You know, did you ever have, I don't know, a family member who like saved all their amazing china to bestow on someone as a great inheritance, but then they're the generation that does not care about fine china and they're like, thanks grandma, what do I do with this, you know? But they like painstakingly accumulated every set of the piece and you know they went to all of the right stores and they got it all matching patterns and then they died and no one cares and it's just a thing they have to deal with you know and so to renounce doesn't mean to give up in the sense of the physical thing it's about the mental attitude of letting go of attachment so so impermanence is the thing that keeps you from getting hooked into I need this specifically for my happiness. Because this specifically, whatever it is, is not going to remain. And so you could think of one person in your life, maybe your spouse or your best friend or your mentor. And part of you thinks, I really need them in my life for a certain kind of happiness. This is a really vital thing. And when they die, I'm going to be devastated. Right, that's sort of true. But also, what about one day with them? If you spent one day with the same person the whole day, Parts of the day you'd feel very close and connected, and parts of the day you'd disagree about where to go to lunch, and parts of the day one of you would say, oh, the view is beautiful, and the other would say, it's too cold. And then, you know, like one of you would get tired first, and, you know, there would be peaks and valleys of closeness. There would be different times of resonance and separation, just one day. And yet our mind has branded it as they are my friend, they are close and the source of all my happiness. But when you're with them, you're not happy the whole time. You know, so we're telling ourselves fibs because it's occasionally true and we've edited our mem memory and patched together all the good bits. It's like, here's all the greatest hits of our time together. And that's what the relationship is. And when it goes, it will be devastating. And you forget all the filler, <laughs> all the filler songs and all the dodgy ones and all the experimental ones. You know, so remembering impermanence is remembering that your need for people has changed over time 
the closeness and distance with the same people has changed over time, who you all are as individuals has changed over time. And if you lose the people in your life right now, there are still more people, <laughs> you know, like you don't need those particular ones. You know, yes, we as human beings, we're social animals, we need each other. Similarly, when you travel, you realize, yeah, you need friends, but you don't need those specific friends. You could get yourself some other ones fairly quickly if you're friendly, you know? And then you realize, well, okay, actually I can go deep and close with people I don't know very well if I just let down my guard and allow myself to be vulnerable. And there, now I've got a bestie, done. You know, and it could feel like you're being disloyal to the close people in your life who have hung in there with you all these years. But if you give one pe person lots of love, it doesn't mean you're taking love from someone else. Yeah. So these, these impermanence conversations, they're so common sense and they're so what you already know. And yet when there is like a wrench in your heart or like something in the pit of your stomach, it's usually been because part of us was in denial about the changeability of things. Yeah, and we're really holding on to a snapshot in time that passed a long time ago and might come again and might even be better, but that moment in time is not the relationship that was a moment in time, right? So it's a delicate dance, you know, because you want to be detached but not disengaged. And then in the chat it says, it's amazing how we've been so conditioned to think to be in a certain way. What a relief to know that this path is freedom. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Like the illusion of a soulmate, right? Like there would just be the one person, right? It's like really many people would do. Enough mutual respect, genuine affection. You could probably make it work with anyone if there was those two things, mutual respect, genuine affection, right? But we, we get this kind of idea, only you, you know, and it's just, it's epically poignant. It's so poignant. And so if when you're feeling yourself a bit jangly and a bit, I don't know, grief stricken or needy, if you can remember the impermanence of things and just kind of free yourself back up again. And when you're in like, for example, physical pain and you can remember impermanence, I won't always feel this way. And then you're less anxious if you're having joy and connection and this is wonderful you can remember impermanence and then you don't try and like capture it and make it get stuck in time and this will never end and let's make it permanent because you know it can't be so remembering impermanence helps with both grief and attachment okay so then the practice of all the bodhisattvas is to avoid destructive friends in whose company the three poisons of mind grow stronger, and we engage less and less in study, reflection, and meditation, so that love and compassion fade away until they are no more. So we're shifting the emphasis of our mental energy. We're not giving up on anyone while still creating healthy boundaries with those who are a negative influence on us. So to say that we engage less and less in study, reflection, and meditation, and our love and compassion fade away and are no more, I mean, that's a pretty strong example. But I think that we do know what, it's, what it is to be surrounded by people whose priorities are very different. Yeah, if you're with people whose priorities are very different, it's hard to always be the one who's trying to lift the conversation. You know, so like if you're with your Dharma community, you sort of can take turns lifting it to a higher place. You know, like if someone's getting a bit gossipy or they're getting a bit self-centered, there's just gentle, maybe even nonverbal ways we nudge each other out of that very gently and collaboratively. Because we're all on the same page about our worldview being about transformation for the benefit of all sentient beings. And then you can go to a group of people who really their whole life is just about money and ambition, and they might be perfectly nice people, they just haven't had the conditions to be exposed to a spiritual path, and you're with them for too many days in a row, you might start worrying about money and ambition, because <laughs> that was in you already, it just wasn't getting nourished, you know, and then you might start gradually forgetting some of the compassion training that you'd come to. Because a lot of our Dharma habits are quite new and we need 
community to bolster them. And when we're with people who have very different priorities, they do have an influence on us. And even if they don't, we can start to feel just really alienated and disconnected from the people around us because we do have such different priorities. So this isn't about cutting anyone out of your life in a harsh way. You know, it's detach with love, right? Leave the door open, keep the light on. But some, some folks, they might feel kind of patronized, condescended to, and judged by you because you're all on this spiritual trip and you feel kind of dragged down and kind of oppressed by them and all their kind of worldly stuff. Why put yourselves through that? <laughs> you know, just kind of like wish them the best and just gently disengage and shift to folks that support the mental attitudes that you want to have supported. So that sounds very, ra you know, sort of practical, but how does that land when you think about that? You know, if you think about a couple folks in your life who may be, you know, a bit negative, destructive, maybe a bit of divisive speech, maybe a bit kind of something, um, but you stick, you kind of stick with them because you're just used to them. Yeah, or you feel obliged. That creating of distance without it feeling like you're excluding or pushing them away is delicate. But sometimes if you shift your energy away, they kind of release and it just kind of, you slowly drift apart and it's okay. Rather, th rather than there needing to be like a famous final scene, you know, and door slamming and enough of you, you know, they can just, gen and then, you know, if they go through some transformation, it might be that you come back to each other and maybe you've already had that happen in your life where you kind of didn't see someone for years and then you were each on your individual journey and then you kind of came back to each other. Um, it can happen and it's lovely when it does, but what's being said here in this verse is don't think that your practice is strong enough to hold up under negative influences when those negative influences are consistent and constant. You'll, we just very naturally mirror the people around us. It's, it's just human nature. And so be around people who are gonna lift you. Do you have kind of, I don't know, any grumbly thoughts about that or kind of sad thoughts about that? Or um, is it just feel like, yay, I'm gonna leave them, okay, bye. I, I struggle with that because I, I, I struggle with the difference you know, I, it, the notion of using my mind to be of benefit to other people is very natural. Where I get, I don't know if I'm if I'm pursuing bodhicitta or just breathtaking codependence, and it's like <laughs> often you know very similar. So it there's a real sense of the people that need the most help, especially as somebody who's a sober person, especially as somebody that's gone through a number of of painful things. I relate to what's happening. And people didn't abandon me, you know, so yeah. it's like real tension there between is this healthy or just really unproductive that I struggle with in a Buddhist context. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and, and I'm guessing you already kind of know the answer, you know, like, you know, that probably going into a certain, you know, I don't know, a bar or something is going to be too much, but being with one other addict when you're feeling grounded is probably fine. You know, if you're in the kind of, I don't know, um, sponsorship role or mentorship role, and you've decided and agreed upon that, and you feel grounded and stable in that, having a few tough cookies in your life is good for us. But if you're surrounded by them, then you'll just become like them. You know, so it's kind of like just knowing your own strength, you know, and kind of knowing what your own strength is on a weekday, rather than kind of making your choices and your commitments based on how you are at your best, you know, make your choices and your commitments based on your worst day, then you can consistently keep it up and not just give up on someone and say, sorry, this is getting too much, you know. And, and sometimes it's, it's a little embarrassing about how little we can cope with, but consistency is really a lot more important than a huge effort and then nothing, mm. you know? And so sustainable support, how many people can we sustainably support giving, you know, given our level? That's, that's a question we just have to answer as an individual. You know, it's like, uh, 
for me, you know, I have, there's a very few people who are actually my students who we have had that discussion. You know, they've asked, I've asked, we've sussed each other out for five or six or seven or eight years. And it's like formalized. And I kind of only take as many as I know I can look after. And everybody else is just Dharma friends, but we don't have that kind of, you know, commitment to each other. And, um, you know, whereas someone like His Holiness can say, you 10,000 people in a crowd, many of whom I will never meet, you are now my students, done. You know, because his mind can do that and he can hold all of us. And if you've never even met him, but you've been in an empowerment with him, you can think very strongly, your holiness, I would like some more guidance on this and this and this, and probably something will come, you know? So it's like, it's just kind of knowing your strength and knowing, you know, you're gradually expanding it. But um, if you over, if you overdo it, there'll be a backlash, you know? And then there'll be resentment about the very commitments you voluntarily took on and you'll resent them even though it was your choice, you know, and all that whole dance. Let's, and then there's a question with, let's see, an aversion to ignorance. During the meditation, I felt more connected to my own attachment to finding other solutions for them, defining what their happiness should be. Is that what I should be detaching from? Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to say, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to say, yeah. But I mean, it's a wonderful thing to know because sometimes, you know, we're sort of like detaching, but then we still want to give them solutions, but we're, you know, kind of back and forth. And the most empowering thing is for people to come to their own solutions, but that doesn't mean you just throw them to the wolves. It means that you create the best atmosphere for them to come to their own solutions. You know, so if a little bit of talking, a little bit of idea sharing, but kind of less is more. If you think to yourself, when have I actually taken someone else's advice? You as an individual, when have you actually taken on board what somebody said? You were usually 90% there yourself and you just needed them for that extra 10%. You were like almost there and you probably asked. <laughs> also, right? Um, unsolicited advice to someone is not usually effective. Every once in a while, if you have the right relationship, it can be. But, you know, whatever you're thinking, how should I be for them? Just kind of come back to, well, what would work for me? Would this work for me? It's like, just because someone says something brilliant and accurate and empathic doesn't mean they're going to hear it. You know, you're like, if I just say it right, well, it's not about how well you said it. Do they have receptor sites to it? If they are receptive to it, you could say it in a clunky, inelegant, inarticulate way, and they would still be able to hear the wisdom in it. You know, that's the thing. But we, we kind of twist ourselves in not saying, well, if I just say it right, and I pick the right time. And, you know, occasionally that's true. But usually it's about just looking for little openings. Are they ready? Are they ready? And have they already said the thing themselves and not heard their own wisdom? Because that's the best I think that we can do as friends is if someone said, I think when I do this, it's usually because of this. And then they keep rabbiting on about something and you say, wait, 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 go back to what you said before. That sounded really important. And it's like you're giving them back their own wisdom rather than force feeding them yours. It, it is tricky because we do wish people well and we want the best for them, but what works for us doesn't necessarily work for them, <laughs> you know, or maybe it will, but just the timing. So. Okay, so we'll just do a few more. And tomorrow we're going to focus more on the six perfection side of the verses and a few more meditations. But I just wanted to get these preliminaries um, down. So this was just the other side of that one, which is the practice of all the bodhisattvas is to cherish spiritual friends by regarding them as even more precious than one's own body, since they are the ones who will help uh, to rid us of all of our faults, to make our virtues grow ever greater, just like the waxing moon. So this is, again, shifting the emphasis of our mental energy. So seeking spiritual mentorship to collaborate with our inner guru and creating healthy relationships with those who are positive influence on us. All right, so those two are companions, right? giving up destructed friends and cherishing spiritual friends. And so then the last part of the preliminaries is this verse seven, which is 
The practice of all the bodhisattvas is to take refuge in the three jewels, since they will never fail to provide protection for all who call upon them. For whom are the ordinary gods of this world ever capable of helping? As long as they themselves are trapped within samsara's vicious cycle. So it's saying, don't rely upon worldly gods or ordinary people when they themselves are trapped. Rely on the three jewels because they have freed themselves from samsara. So the three jewels, of course, are Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, which we think of as doctor, nurse, medicine. And the question is, how do we rely upon them? So when people say to you, take refuge, or I'm taking refuge, what do you hear? How do you take refuge? What does that look like experientially? Is taking refuge asking to be saved? <laughs> Is taking refuge relying on something external? Yeah, letting go, Denise is saying, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what are you taking refuge in specifically? You know, if you're, if you're a Dharma student, you know that you're taking refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, you know, the teacher, his teachings in his community, or the doctor, the medicine, and the nurses, and you're doing this from the bottom of your heart, yada, yada, yada. But what you're actually taking refuge in, of course, is the medicine and the medicine that you take. So what's really being said is you're taking refuge in your own mental development because that is what will protect you. You know, what's gonna protect you from suffering and its causes is your own mental development. And of course that mental development relies upon having met with tools and having someone explain them to you and having people surround that process to kind of uplift it and help you with dosage and side effects, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is very necessary, but the real refuge is your own integration of these ideas. And that will give you protection. That's the very thing. So you're sort of praying for your own development. <laughs> and you're kind of telling yourself you want it. And, you know, so then who are you praying to? You're kind of talking to yourself. And that's very useful. And of course, you are asking for some divine intervention, but it's much more that you're trying to open yourself up to the fact that it's already there. You know, the Buddhas don't need you to ask for you for them to be there you know even in lots of prayers and practices there's the invocation verses all oh, buddhas and bodhisattvas come here now what you're saying is i'm ready now since you're already here now i'm ready before i was just distracted and all foggy and closed up but right now i'm ready and so an invocation is really just saying i'm ready for the fact that you're here they've been ringing the doorbell the whole time you're finally opening the door does that make sense so when you, when you see refuge, of course, the Buddha, his teachings and his community are very important, but the real thing that's going to protect you is the Dharma that you've integrated. Yeah, the refuge piece is very important, um, but understanding it is key. So you're taking safe direction from your own mental integration. And so refuge is motivated by, you know, in the Lam Rim, they say fear and faith. But what they mean is a healthy fear about what your own untamed mind will create for itself. And a faith based in logic, reason, and experience that the Dharma tools are useful and work. Yeah, so with that motivation, then you turn to this tools and this skill set. That's that whole section there, done and dusted. So the preparation is important, and I know I gave it a lot of time, but I gave it a lot of time because it's important. And the rest of the verses are variations on a theme, and it's illuminating the path or kind of bringing light to the path. And here we get into the Lamrim framing, which is um, the path for beings of lesser capacity, the path for beings of medium capacity, and the path for beings of superior capacity, sometimes called the small scope, medium scope, and great scope, um, meaning the scope of their ability, but also the scope of intention or motivation. Do you guys have a kind of a general Lomrim understanding of that structure? Does that sound very new? The three scopes, is that something you're familiar with? Anybody totally confused? three scopes. It's, it's a framework that'll just keep coming up again and again. And basically what's being said is that we're categorizing the Buddha's teachings 
and we're categorizing them based on who has the ability to practice this set, but also what is your motivation in practicing them. So you could be like a small scope practitioner in terms of your ability, but have a great scope motivation. And that's kind of where we are, is that we're, we might not even be small scope, we might be just preliminaries, but our motivation is the great scope. Yeah. So um, anyway, that's the long ring framing and it'll keep coming up again and again, but I'm sure other people will keep explaining it. So if it's not clear, it will become so. And so for beings of the initial or small scope and beings of the medium scope, um, we have verses eight and nine. And then the whole rest of the text is bodhicitta or great scope. Eight is the practice of all the bodhisattvas is never to commit a harmful act even though not to do so may put one's very life at risk. For the sage himself has taught how negative actions will ripen into the manifold miseries of the lower realm so difficult to endure. So there's your teaching on karma. So it's saying, even if the harmful act seems immediately beneficial, it's gonna have this ripple effect that makes it just not worth it. And then nine is the practice of all the bodhisattvas is to strive toward the goal which is the supreme state of changeless, everlasting liberation. Since all the happiness of the three realms lasts but a moment and is then quickly gone, just like dewdrops on a blade of grass. What they're saying here is we need to be motivated by more than this life. So in the small scope, we're aiming for a good future life. In the medium scope, we're aiming to end samsara. But then the great scope, we're aiming for complete Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. But they, they layer upon each other. You know, you can't be an actual great scope practitioner unless you genuinely are thinking about future lives. And you can't be a medium scope practitioner unless you're genuinely wanting to get out of samsara. And if you genuinely want to get out of samsara, then you can move on to becoming a great scope practitioner. But the question is, most of the time, are we just trying to get through the day, <laughs> you know? And it's okay to just want to get through the day, but if you can be doing that with the mind that says, may everything that happens today, good and bad, lead towards my enlightenment, then fine. But most of the time we forget that part and we're just going through the motions and life just races by. So the, what we wanna start doing is, if we're not already, is in the morning to set that bodhicitta motivation very firmly. Even if you're still in bed, even if you're all cozy under the blankies, even if it's the middle of winter and there's snow outside, if you're just all cozied up, you know, and you think the purpose of my life is, and then you're like, to hit the snooze button, no, to work for the welfare of all sentient beings, right? <laughs> and you can still be in bed and just like keep thinking it, until it's true again. Yeah, and you just keep thinking it. And you know, you're like, I want to think this, but I'm not feeling it because it's cold and I forgot socks and I'm gonna have to run to the bathroom. But you're thinking, I'm just gonna keep thinking it until it's true again. And I'm gonna get out of bed and I'm gonna go to the bathroom and I'm gonna brush my teeth and I'm just gonna keep in the back of my thinking, the purpose of my life is. And then by the time you get to your meditation cushion, it's true. But sometimes we get to the meditation cushion and we're like, I'm not feeling it, <laughs> you know? And you feel like maybe you have to force yourself or you push yourself or your practice becomes like a chore, you know, rather than something that lifts your day and makes everything meaningful. It feels like something you should do to be a good person or something, or to maintain your reputation as a spiritual practitioner or some nonsense. You know, so do it, do these practices in ways that make sense for your schedule, with your body, with your lifestyle. You know, th the point is it's a thought, you know, you can have a thought while doing anything else, can't you? You know, so if you can just kind of be, what is the point of all this? And get yourself back to bodhicitta. And then at the end of the day, do a check-in and ask, when did I forget bodhicitta and why? When did I stay with bodhicitta and why? Of course, it's great to do rejoicing and it's great to do Vajrasattva practice and purification. If you can do those things, that's wonderful. But the main thing is to really not let your life just kind of slip by with all the days blurring into each other and be able to bookend each day with asking, what is my path? How did I do staying on it? 
What is my path? How did I do staying on it? You know, without any kind of like punishing, rewarding attitude, but just like a really objective assessment that is nudging towards the positive at a pace that's sustainable for you. Because what you're doing is creating mental habits that you can take with you life to life to life. If when you practice, you're saying all the right things and you're doing all the right tick list, but you're hating it or you're tired or you're resisting it or you're some sort of self-punishing weirdness, then what you'll have is an association of stress with spiritual practice. And your next life, you'll meet the spiritual path and you'll feel stressed. It's like we want to pick up where we left off. You know, whenever we die and then we're reborn, we want to pick up where we left off. And our associations right now and our habits right now are what we'll be able to take with us. We probably won't have control over where and how we're reborn. What we'll really just have is our habits. So make very strong, positive associations with your path and a friendliness with yourself in relationship to your path you know, so that you have these really positive associations of liking it. So gently, gently, but um, that's how to let life not pass you by and start moving into this great scope mentality, which is here. Okay, so third is the path for beings of superior capacity or great scope practice to achieve Buddhahood. And here's where we get into like explicit bodhicitta practice, even though everything came before our practices of a bodhisattva, even though small scope, medium scope, preliminaries, etc., we were doing them all with a bodhicitta motivation. Here's explicit bodhicitta practice. So lots of types of bodhicitta, lots going on there, um, but we'll just unpack it. So we already discussed what bodhicitta is. Now we're just going to look at the two bodhicittas. So conventional and ultimate, they're related to the two aspects of reality and how to practice in response to each. Okay, so there are two bodhicittas and they're broken down in accordance with the two types of reality or the two levels of truth. So conventional bodhicitta is the bodhicitta that we normally talk about, that main Mahayana motivation, the altruistic mind that seeks enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. When it's fully qualified, it's an uncontrived, spontaneous main mind, et cetera, et cetera. If you go down to that second piece, there are two types of conventional bodhicitta aspiring and engaging, okay? So conventional bodhicitta has aspiring and engaging. Um, you guys have some bodhicitta background, all these types. Um, if you studied Guide to a Bodhisattva's Way of Life, you're aware of aspiring and engaging bodhicitta as being like the difference between the wish to go and actually going, right? So you like the idea of bodhicitta and want to want it, <laughs> and then there's actually engaging with it. You know, you're like, I would like to be motivated that way. I'm not, but I'd like to be, <laughs> you know, and then there's actually setting out on it. I think the important part of the definition is this idea of a main mind or a primary consciousness, that when you actually have bodhicitta, that when it's uncontrived and fully qualified, that means it's imbuing every other thought in your life. Every other choice, every decision, every movement of mind is then implicitly or explicitly showing a bodhicitta practice. And for us right now, bodhicitta is just a mental factor. It's a thought that comes and goes. And it's one we have to stop and think about and bring up to the surface and kind of recall and revive and refresh. And then it'll stay with us for, you know, a few hours. And then it just kind of slowly becomes quiet. And maybe we keep a general sense of friendliness, politeness, and altruism, but it's not like active bodhicitta in the background. You know, it's just kind of like quietened down to politeness, <laughs> right? Which is not quite as powerful as bodhicitta. When you repeat this though, again and again, it sticks. And that is totally different than what happens to negative states of mind. Negative states of mind, you can become so habituated to, they come very naturally, but they actually will never become a main mind primary consciousness. They can't become one with your mind. And that's, that's a fantastic difference. And if you think about something like anger, 
when you're very, very, very angry, like boiling angry, like shaking angry, you can't really stay that way that long. Like you can keep firing it up and reminding yourself of why you're mad and come back to it. But like that, like shaking rage, could you stay that way day after day after day at that level without like consciously fueling the fire, you know, with some like bellows of excessive analysis, you know, you'd, you'd wear yourself out. You can stay grumpy about whatever it was and still be really annoyed by it. But that like heightened shaking rage is not a thing that stays. On the other hand, though, I'm guessing that there have been times when you're feeling very connected to your family or your community or something, and you were really feeling in resonance with your path, and you had that deep contentment associated with love and compassion, maybe for several days at a time, maybe for weeks at a time. Maybe you didn't have a negative state of mind really show its head for ages, you know? So these, these mental states when you're well habituated to them, they can stick and they don't wear you out. You know, you just kind of, you know, shine them up again or hit refresh on your internal browser and kind of freshen them up. But, but they, they kind of want to stick the more you repeat them and they don't hurt you when doing so. Whereas with anger, if you keep like trying to refresh your anger, you just wear yourself out and who needs that? But anyway, so bodhicitta is the sort of thing that if we accustom ourselves to it, it can just be our natural way of being. It can just be how we are all the time. Live in your life normal, live in your life, quote, spiritual, doing this or that, but everything is imbued with bodhicitta. And, and maybe you've met people who it seems like that might be the case. They have that kind of lit from within aspect to them. And when you're with them, there's a deep sense of safety um, I know with, with one of my teachers, even when he's scolding me, I never feel hurt by it. You know, like he might say, Yintin, that thinking is rubbish. And, and I'll go, it is rubbish. Thank you. <laughs> Whereas if someone, if one of my friends said that, I'd be like, oh, <laughs> you know, if I was in a really bad mood. Um, and I, I just feel like everything he's doing is for the welfare of others. And you just feel kind of safe and held in that space. And that is a remarkable sort of being to be around, but we don't want to make it so remarkable that we don't remember that's how we will be. You know, that is our potential and we're already moving in that direction. You know, so when you meet these kind of special people like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, see it as a representation of who you're going to be when you grow up, not a magical being totally divorced from who you are. They're just the end of a process you've already begun. You know, it's important to think of it that way. And it's why people like His Holiness say, say that they're just a simple monk because they're trying to demysticize the path. It's like, it is magical and mystical, but it's also very ordinary and everyday. And if you think this is for special people, then you don't try and achieve it yourself because you think, well, I'm not special, you know? So relative bodhicitta, these two types, then we have ultimate bodhicitta, which is the perfection of wisdom known in Sanskrit as prajnaparamita. It's the direct unmediated realization of emptiness. It's not the direct realization of emptiness alone, rather it is the direct realization in union with bodhicitta, the aspiration to become a Buddha, etc. So in other words, ultimate Bodhicitta is bodhicitta in the mind of a bodhisattva who has realized emptiness directly. So they've achieved the Mahayana path of seeing. So they have a, a perceptual realization of emptiness. So, you know, generally speaking, there are people who have realized emptiness who are not bodhisattvas. But when we say ultimate bodhicitta, we're talking about someone who has realized emptiness and is also a bodhisattva. So it's that Bodhichi, it's that realization in the mind of a bodhisattva. So this is the most powerful thing because in its simplest form, what we're saying is understanding infinite dependent arising is like understanding the context behind a villain. If you understand the context behind someone, you have compassion. You don't even need to try. They don't even have to stop being awful 
compassion comes naturally when you understand the context of this suffering happened and this historical thing happened and this and this happened. And if you don't have compassion, you probably don't have enough context. I'm sure there's people in your life who have behaved very badly and then you found out that they were going through something horrible and you forgave them and you weren't angry at them anymore. But they continued to behave badly. But it didn't get you. It didn't hook you. So ultimate bodhicitta is saying absolutely everything makes sense given its context. Everything will make sense when you understand emptiness. Things don't make sense because we don't understand emptiness. We're, we're missing the point, which is that everything is missing inherence because it dependently arises. Nothing is standing alone. And so if you're wanting to be of benefit to all sentient beings, it's much easier if you understand reality. You know, you're not trying to like squeeze yourself into, oh, I should really be patient with them. I'm sure they're going through something. You know, you're squeezing yourself into it. If you understand emptiness, there's no squeezing. You're just like, of course, I'm not going to react to that. I get how that happened. And you still might take actions to correct injustice, but it's not coming at all from your own anger. So emptiness is like the space of infinite possibility, but the reason why things are empty is because they dependently arise, and that is very accessible, and we already understand how to do that. We've done it already, we just didn't label it that way. So the easiest way to understand emptiness is to meditate on the fact of dependent arising and to see everything, or everything impermanent relies on causes and conditions. Everything impermanent and permanent relies on parts and context and a mind's imputation on a valid basis. Nothing is independently arisen out of nowhere, right? There's no causeless thing, you know? And so knowing that then you kind of release and relax and forgive and drop the drama. So ultimate bodhicitta is very powerful. Understanding emptiness, of course, is powerful even before it's a realization, but when you combine it with bodhicitta, it's like an atom bomb for all your delusions. Tonight, um, your homework, should you choose to accept it, is just to read all of the verses once and to really think about them. We'll do some dedication. Um, <laughs> Janchu sem jo rimbo she ma ke panam ke gyuchi ke pan yam ba me ba hi gone gone du pawa sho toni da wa rimbo she ma ke panam ke gyuchi ke pan yam ba me ba hi gone gone du pawa sho so thanks everyone and uh, see you tomorrow Thank you.